Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, sir. So, uh, in today's laboratory, we will be performing the final experiments with uh, 8085. But before beginning the today's work, let me uh, tell you what assignments I have put and uh, how they are to be done. Is my screen visible to everyone? Yes. Yeah, so I have uh, put these three uh, lab files and uh, uh, today we, you will again have one more lab file. So there will be four lab files in all and the format is common to every lab. So the highlighted portions in blue are the portions which will correspond to the current experiment for every file, right? So in lab one, uh, the experiment that we did was study of various parts of 8085 microprocessor. So that was day one and we tried to study various parts of this microprocessor. Yeah, so by various parts, what do I mean is we studied the program for uh, transferring the data between internal registers of 8086. Like we use the commands MOV and MVI, etc. So by those commands, we could move the data within the internal registers A, B, C, D, E, H, L of the microprocessor. So that was the very first and simple thing that we did there. Second thing, we uh, wrote a program to demonstrate the usage of external memory, right? So how to access one byte of external memory or how to read or write one byte of external memory. So you can just make a simple program uh, demonstrating the usage of external memory byte. How can you access that? Then we also saw how to use a stack, how to use a stack in 8085 by reading one byte from that, right? So uh, we also saw how to initialize the stack at some non-default location. So that's what we did. And uh, we also saw flag bits in 8085. So we also studied the flag registers. So to be able to understand the various components of microprocessor, this is the basic minimum. Although input output uh, programming is also there, then interrupt programming is there. But to begin with in laboratory one, we have done these four experiments. So uh, what, what you need to do is, this title should be written as it is. Then all the other topics I have already discussed how you have to write. The main section will be this, uh, your uh, observation, calculation, and result. This can be combined into one. And here you will be just pasting uh, the screenshots of the code that you have made with proper explanation. With proper explanation, you have to do that. So you can just take the screenshots of your code and it, they should be properly explaining all the concepts that are covered in these four subparts of the experiment, right? And uh, some small questions for Sample questions I have also put at the end of each file. So you need to answer them. So the, uh, you, you can just put at max a one paragraph explanation or two or three line explanation for each and every question. And uh, if it requires elaborate understanding, you can do that also in more pages. And uh, both of the file types are acceptable, whether they are typed files or handwritten files. So wherever it suits you, I mean, I mean you can have a combination of half typed file and half handwritten file, that is also fine because in some problems that will be like that where you have to explain something. So you can just type, write it in a piece of paper and properly scan it by using your mobile phones and attach it in the form of an image in this file and finally make a PDF of that. So only PDF files will be accepted, Word files, etc., will not be accepted. So this is for lab number one, right? For lab number two, 
let me again open that file so for lab number 2 again we performed uh, this experiment of uh, unconditional and conditional jump and call instructions in microprocessor right so this is what we did and that we did in four basic parts so we made a fibonacci series obviously fibonacci series will be made by making loops and we made loops using your conditional jump statements so fibonacci series program was there and then we have to write a assembly language program to create a, a subroutine that multiplies two numbers and gives output as a result so when you want to write a subroutine or a function you make use of call instructions right so it could be a conditional call or a unconditional call we did this by using a unconditional uh, call statement so that's what you need to explain and uh, then we saw a program for adding two 16 bit numbers with and without using dad instruction so dad instruction was also covered in lecture today so for 16 bit addition that is used where the default register will will be hl register pair right so uh and the last program was write an alp to fill the register b with value 01 h if the contents at external memory location are uh, external memory location 3000 and 4000 are equal and if they are not equal you have to fill a 2 with that right so this can be achieved by using these condition uh, conditional statements conditional jump statements so since if they are equal one thing has to be done if they are not equal some another thing has to be done so you may use this conditional or uh, i mean conditional jump statement to achieve this particular task so in this lab in lab number 2 we got introduced to your conditional and unconditional jump and call statements and the questions here are uh, how do you implement loops in 885 so in 885 there are no loops as such loops are implemented by using jump statements so those are conditional and unconditional jump statements so that complete a uh, theory can be written here and the second is how do you implement if else statement in 8085 alp so if statements you can just give a, a simple example of uh, where you know uh, the, the simple example could be this program number 4 also i mean this program uh, implements something which relates to the ideology of if else statement in programming language and that same program can be cited here as being an answer to this particular question right so this was for lab number 2 and in lab number 3 we uh, studied the interrupts in 8085 microprocessor right so there was only one primary program that we discussed right an assembly language program to demonstrate the usage of software interrupt rst4 in 8085 alp clearly illustrating the code and related concepts so this is uh, this is a program which requires a lot of explanation even if you have screenshots to paste uh, after pasting screenshots you need to explain what happens with every step right so uh, you intelligently need to make a smart diagram or uh, something which will explain um, every concept of interrupts in just one screenshot or maybe a couple of screenshots because you cannot just run every step and then attach that many screenshots although that will also be fine if you do that right and then there are these two questions which which are what do you understand what do you do when interrupt service routine is more than 8 bytes is it a problem in first place so you have to answer this question we have discussed that uh, you know the for vectored interrupts the addresses that they have they are having a gap of 8 bytes only so if the difference between the i mean if the length of the program is more than 8 bytes then you have to use a jump instruction to be able to divert the control to that location and then come back after that is executed so that's what you need to mention here and uh, explain why is page 0 and uh, explain what is page 0 and why is it not recommended to write any user defined code there so you need to explain what is page 0 page 0 contains all the uh, beginning address of your interrupts and if you write some code there then uh, if an interrupt gets called so there will be some problem so you need to explain all these concepts here so these this is for the three labs that we have done and uh, 
these are not the only programs that we have covered there. There are small other programs also which we made, but for the purposes of file submission, only this much portion will be sufficient. So all you have to do is you have to create a PDF version. And uh, uh, since some of you pointed out that uh, the assignment is not visible in your view of Microsoft Teams, so I will ask the administrators and make some changes accordingly so that you will be able to view it. So the date of submission is the coming Saturday, right? Uh, before this Independence Day, coming Saturday is the date of submission. So in that time, you have to submit all the four files, including today's lab, right? So in today's lab, we will also do some small programs. So that's what we intend to do. So any doubts from Sir, the point? Deadline. No, deadline cannot be extended. Ultimately, you know, with every lab, you should have submitted these files. But I knew that the primary point was reading these programs, right? To be able to make these programs. And in these files, you don't have to do much. As you have seen here, everything is already written here. You just have to write a one line explanation for every other heading. And that will remain more or less common to uh, all the formats. All you have to do is take screenshots and paste in this section of observation results and calculations, right? With some explanation. So I cannot further extend the deadline. Files share कर दीजिए. What? तेरी ये चारों files share कर दीजिए. Yeah, I have shared it. I have already shared it in your MS Teams in files section, uh, in the okay. folder named as lab material. So those are files. Files are already there since yesterday, and uh, uh, in in this in this precautions section, there is a section for precautions also. I guess uh, interpretation of results. Observe. Ah, uh, yeah. In this precautions yeah. section. You need to write the uh, the precautions that you need to have with the software that you are using, right? For example, in 8085 GNU 8085 software, I told you that when you start executing it, the first address will not be displayed in the program counter register. So that is one of the precautions that you can write here. Then in uh, the Jubin simulator software, we already know that if we press Alt Right button. The statement will be executed by then. However, in a GNU 8085, if there is a blue cursor on the current line of code, it means that will be the next line which is going to be executed. So these are some points of differences that you can mention in the precautions section. In today's lecture, I will also tell you uh, one more uh, uh, shortcoming of Jubin's simulator. As in the earlier lecture, we have seen that. In Jubin Simulator, while you draw the timing diagrams, they treat this memory read cycle and operand fetch cycle by the same name. Although we know that they are technically different, so that point can also be mentioned as a precaution here, right? And one more precaution I will be taking, I will be telling you in today's lab session. So those all precautions they will be common to every file. So it's not that. You have to write one precaution in one file and other precaution in other. So all of them can be combinedly written. So that way your workload will be reduced, right? So most of the headings will remain common. Only uh, this section, that is the theoretical background, will be changed. Plus the screenshots you have to paste in a combined section of observation, calculation, results, and interpretation. So there you have to paste the, your screenshots and you have to answer these questions in two or three lines. So only these three sections are going to change. You already have your screenshots by now. It's just a matter of pasting and writing some minimal explanation. So I think this week is sufficient for that. And uh, if we see the procedure, you should submit lab file at the end of every lab, right? But uh, I didn't want you to do that because I understand that you have a lot of other work to do. But then again, 8085 will be complete by today. So the file has to be submitted by Saturday. I cannot extend the deadline till Sunday because Sunday is Independence Day, so that is a national holiday. Otherwise, I would have put that by the end of Sunday also. But then you need to submit it by 14th, right? Uh, 14th no, no, night. No. You can put it 15th. Uh, no, no, no. I cannot. That I cannot do legally because it's a national holiday, and I cannot assign you any work on national holiday. So 14th is uh, the deadline for that submission. And I have announced this deadline uh, way back when we were in lab number one or lab number two. So uh, you need to submit these files, and I will let you know the interface where you have to submit them. Right. So uh, 
uh, just someone quickly tell me what are the contents that we covered in previous week so that i can give you some experiments huh in the previous week what have we covered we have covered i think timing diagrams then input output and addressing modes and instruction set in the today's lecture right so timing diagrams were done input output was there and uh, addressing modes was done right so now your first task is to write a simple program and calculate the amount of time that it takes to get executed time in seconds right so that's what you have to do so the first task is write a simple program and calculate the amount of time that it takes to get executed in 8085 so you have to do some calculations for that right and your program and your program should uh, contain some conditional call statements also i mean i have demonstrated some uh, some of these commands here and these commands will sometime be executed in 18 t seconds and in some time they will be executed in 90 seconds so it your program might contain these and it might not contain these so so, so to begin with uh, just make a simple program which reads a byte of data from the external memory and uh, then copies it into the internal register right so i am giving you two separate questions calculate the time for their execution and let me know by the by uh, solving these two questions you will be able to understand that if the work is done within the microprocessor it is very easy right it is very time efficient if you use the external memory it will be time consuming right so uh, write down the question write down the question that i am giving to you i will also type it here Uh, so first question is there are five bytes of data stored in put in b c d e h registers so these five registers they contain some five byte data what do you have to do <laughs> see you can all switch off your mics ratik switch off your mic so uh, you have to add all these and store the result in accumulator right in accumulator register so this is the first question second question is also the same but now uh, five byte data the stored the stored in external memory right write a program to add those five bytes and store the result in external memory that's what you have to do so this is essentially the same program you have to make these two programs and the combined task that you have to do is calculate calculate the time these two programs take to execute execute and the time should be in seconds right so that's what you have to do uh, they are essentially doing the same task but inside the first question every work will be done within the cpu registers right and for the second question uh, 
external memory needs to be accessed. So by executing these two programs, calculating the total number of T states, and since you already know the frequency of microprocessor, it is three megahertz, although the range is from 500 kilohertz to 3.1 to 5 megahertz, you will assume that it works at three megahertz, right? So one by three megahertz will be the time one T state will take. So you need to calculate the time for both of these and you need to verify it through Jubin simulator that the calculation that you have done is same and you need to compare the time in the end, right? So this is the first exercise that you have to do today. So it is 310 by my watch. Will you be able to do it by 325? All of you? Yes or no? We'll try, sir. Yeah, please try. It's a very simple program. You have already made it, right? It's just a set of two or three commands only. So try this program, make the calculations, and show the results to me. So this is 310. I will talk to you again at 325. And I'm still available here. If you have any doubts, you can always ask. So take the screenshot of this question. I will switch off my screen because otherwise, you know, the bandwidth on both the sides will be utilized and it will not be in our interest. You may take the screenshot of these set of questions.
Completed. Raise your hands if you are still present in the laboratory. Okay, so I only see few people here, around 20 people here. Okay, I forgot to record this lab, so let me put this recording on. Anyway, we haven't done anything as of now, so let me just record this lab. <coughs> yeah, so anyone who has completed the code, these are very simple codes five data pieces, they are kept in some registers. You have to add them. After adding them, you just have to calculate the total number of T states. And whatever is the total number of T states, suppose it is 20, you have to multiply it by one by three megahertz. So anyone who has calculated the time, it is a very simple exercise. Raise your hands if you are completed or partially done with the program. Okay, so you keep on completing this program. I give you some extra time, but before that, there is something interesting for demonstration. So I'm again sharing my screens. Uh, please have a look at this. So is my screen visible to everyone? Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, uh, if if you were in college, obviously there will be hardware kits onto which we will be performing experiment. Is it or is it not? Yes, sir. 
So how does the hardware kit looks like? Let me just show you the hardware kit. How does it look like? How to enter programs in that? So the hardware kit that I'm going to show you now is actually the real hardware kit that we are using in our current laboratory. And it is a microcomputer system. You have your desktops or you have your laptops with you. So the hardware kit that I'm going to show you today is a complete microcomputer system in itself. It has its own uh, you know, microprocessor, it has its own display, it has its own keyboard, it has its own various uh, peripheral devices that you can imagine for a system. So here is the kit. You can call it from uh, this 8085 simulator that I have given to you, Jubin's simulator. So uh, in the view tab, if you will go, there is this 8085 microprocessor trainer kit. And if you will open it, an interface like this will appear. So all of you can try it side by side also, or you can view this and then try it. So this is the exact same kit that we are using inside a laboratory, inside our own laboratory, right? So let me first introduce you to the various elements of this complete kit. And uh, then we will see how to enter program into this, how to see the A, B, C, D, E, H, L registers, how to see various memory locations and whatnot, right? So uh, if you see here, there are various integrated circuits uh, which are applied here. So can somebody identify where is the microprocessor? Which IC is the microprocessor? Okay, before microprocessor, uh, let us identify the display unit here. Which is the display unit? Red color. In, in red color, you can see. What is this display technically called as? This is called a seven segment display. Have you heard this name earlier? Seven segment display? No. No? Okay. No, so you should have heard this in your digital logic course. But anyway, I will just give you an idea of what seven segment display is. Let me minimize it for a while. And uh, okay, let me take this dark color. And let me take this one. So this is one, this is two, this is three, this is four, this is five, this is six, and this is seven. So how many lines do you see here? Seven lines are there. Right. And these kind of displays you might have seen at railway stations or uh, various places. And if you want to display, suppose a number three, what will I do? I will make this portion darker. I will make this portion darker, this portion darker, this one and this one. So this will depict a figure of three on the seven segment display. So now do you understand what is a seven segment display? Why is it called as a seven segment display? And what is it capable of? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Just wait a minute. Oh, let me switch off my inverter. Yeah. So this seven segment display is nothing. To be able to display one digit, one digit which is from zero to nine you have these eight uh, i mean you have these seven segments which are there which depicts a figure of eight and whatever number you want to display you accordingly make those uh, leds as high so all of these are like tube lights or they are like leds right so whenever you want to display a number three these should be highlighted and the numbering of these, it is like this. This is A, this is B, this is C, D, E, F, and this is G. So they are numbered in this particular fashion. So this is a seven segment display for one single digit. And in the microprocessor tra trainer kit that I am showing you, this trainer kit, how many uh, seven segment displays are attached here? Six. <laughs> Six seven segment displays. Uh, can somebody uh, just tell me why six? Why not seven? Why not five? Any guess? I mean, I haven't told you any logic behind this, but from whatever we have studied till now, can somebody tell me uh, why six? Why not five or seven or eight or more or less? Uh, 
So, okay, answer this question. Uh, if you want to see something at the external memory location, what do you need? The address of that memory location and the data which is kept at that memory location. So, address can be accommodated in how many number of hexadecimal digits? Four. Four. And the data in two hexadecimal digits. So, that is why you have got six hexadecimal digits here or six seven segment displays display here. Is it now understood? Yes, sir. <coughs> now, uh, let us have a look at the keyboard, right? So this is the complete display. I mean, you do not get a nice TFT or L, uh, LCD display here like you have in your laptops, which can display video songs, etc. So in the initial computer, this was the screen that you had. So all of whatever you are doing could be seen here. Now, let's have a look at the keyboard. <coughs> so this keyboard is not the usual keyboard. It is the keyboard of those times. Right. So, <coughs> how uh, can can somebody justify why there are some alphabets which are absent and why there are uh, some numbers which are present and absent? You can see the numbers here are zero, one, two, then three, four, five, six, seven, <coughs> eight, nine. And then from A to F, A, B, C, D, then E is here, and then F must be somewhere. So this is F. So uh, already we know that everything is displayed in hexadecimal format in 8085. So you have digits from A to F, right? And uh, numbers from 0 to 9. Then for stack pointer, you have SP, and uh, this PC, you have got program counter, right? So this is the keyboard that was available at that time. And when you will enter the actual laboratory, you will see a keyboard of this kind, which is attached onto this kit. So we have now got a familiarization with uh, our display unit, which is a seven segment display, a combination of six seven segment displays and a keyboard unit. Now let us try to identify our microprocessor. Can somebody just find out where the microprocessor is. There are multiple ICs in this, multiple integrated circuits. So this is a complete microcomputer system. So uh, now you do not get a proper cabinet where all of your uh, motherboard, et cetera, will be hidden. You are getting this as a single chip, right? So there are various ICs which are connected onto that board. So this is the motherboard itself. And on that motherboard, your display unit and keyboard is also attached. So this is the kind of computer we used to had when it all began. So if you properly see it here, there is something which is written here, 8085 CPU. So on your versions of software, you can zoom it and see it. This is 8085 CPU. It is written here. Let me zoom it and show it to you if it is possible because the software is made on Java and Java does not allow you to zoom in nicely. OK, can can uh, can you see that uh, this 8085 CPU is written here, although it is covered in some uh, casing, but 8085 CPU is written. Can everyone see that? Yes, sir. Similarly, there is this uh, space for memory chips. So this is memory two, memory one and memory zero. So in three parts, you can attach memories. It is written here one, two and three. So this is the memory chip attachment part, and you can see that some portion of memory is left vacant. Not all the portion of 64 kilobyte is used. They are only using two chips. So these are memory chips that you have got, right? So this is the externally interfaced memory. It is not present in this IC itself. It is externally interfaced to this microprocessor, right? Uh, now, there are different ICs that you can see here. This is the timer or counter IC, which we are going to study in this course after the completion of 8086 because these ICs are common to everyone. So this timer and counter IC is responsible for creating various periodic uh, signals inside the microprocessor. Then there are various ICs that you will see here, right? So we are going to study these ICs separately when 8086 is completed. So these uh, can be interfaced with our computer to make a complete microcomputer system. 
And can you see this 74138IC? We have used this IC somewhere. What is this IC? 74138IC. Do you remember this IC? We have read it in some lecture. Okay, figure out which IC is this where we have used it. Yeah, somebody is saying something. I can only listen to the noise, not the voice. 7413. Huh, we have seen this IC in our course when we were discussing this address percent data bus and the latching of uh, the external address into some IC. So there we saw this. So you can see it from the lectures itself again. Now this is the keyboard and display controller. So ultimately this is a seven segment display. What is to be displayed on? Sir, I think. Uh, yeah, tell me. Sir, I think you have uh, taught us seven four one three eight version of eight zero eight five processor. Eight zero eight five is not seven four one three eight. This is an IC which we used somewhere in diagrams. So you might see it in uh, the previous lectures. Or otherwise, it is not necessary for you input to remember output. the number. Input so output what? that input output that truth table we studied was it? Uh, that? that was seven four one S three eight something. So that is also uh, this same family member. It is a cousin IC to that, and it will be doing the same thing. So you have correctly pointed it out, but don't worry. You don't need to remember the number of this. So this is an IC which is dedicated to keyboard and display controller. So how to display things on this on this uh, key, uh, display controller that you are using so it is done by this particular ic similarly whatever keystrokes that you will be making through this keyboard they will all be dealt by this particular ic so is this understood how a complete microcomputer system is made how this complete microcomputer system is made by attaching various ic's onto a single board uh, you have a keyboard monitor, then this main 8085 IC, then you have supporting ICs. Some of them are controlling keyboard, some of them are acting as decoder, some of them are for input output lines, some of them are for timer and programmer operations. So you will see various ports are also there. So this is one port, this is another kind of port. So we will see what can be interfaced with this IC and uh, how can we use this complete computer system. Now inside laboratories, inside laboratories, we do not use these softwares usually to carry out programming. We only use this software for one or two labs. And after that, we perform experiment on this particular kit, right? So how do, how do I mean, you, you have a program, right? You write a program. Uh, suppose you have write a, written a program, which I have given to you in the beginning of this lab. And that program is to be entered into this kit. How will you enter it? since everything can be entered through keyboard only. So you won't be able to write a program in this particular format. This is the program, suppose, which you have written. Uh, LDAC050, CMA, STAC051, and HLT. So this is the kind of program that you have written here. Now, this program cannot be entered in this form of mnemonics into this microprocessor. What goes in this microprocessor is, is, is just numbers hexadecimal numbers. So in the externally interfaced memory, which happens to be this chip, you have to feed in this program. And inside this memory, only hexadecimal numbers can go, right? So we need to learn how to operate this microprocessor system to be able to enter this code. So what we will do is, earlier I had circulated one PDF file, which contains the hexadecimal equivalent of various commands. Do you still have that? All of you still have that PDF file which I have circulated to you? Yes, sir. Yeah. So from that PDF file, you will make out the hexadecimal equivalent of this code, right? So you will see LDA, what it means. C050 is already in hexadecimal. So in the little Indian format, they have to be attached after LDA. And uh, you know, uh, you will be getting, you will be getting uh, something of this kind. This hex code will be available to you after you see that table, right? And this hex code is now to be entered into this particular system. So what will you do? First of all, you will reset the microprocessor. So once you reset the microprocessor, you can see that all of these, they become dashed. 
right? So there is nothing which is displayed on keyboard as of now. Then you will press this button of set slash MEM, set the memory, right? So then these dashes will disappear after you press this. Then you will just press the initial address. I mean, this program is beginning from C000. You want to write this program from C000, right? So on this keyboard only, you will press C000. So either you can use this keyboard or I am using the keyboard of my laptop. So you will press C, then one, two, three. C000 address has been entered here, right? Now we want to change the content of this particular memory location. So you will press this INR uh, thing and what will you type here? This 3A. So I have already pre-entered this program here. So you, uh, if you want to enter it again, you will simply type 3 and then you will type A. So your content of this memory location will be changed. Then again, you will press INR, this INR button. So you will reach to C001 location. Now you want to change this to uh, 30 after 3a you have got 50 so you want to end 50, enter 50 here i have already entered it so to be able to enter it you will again press inr and you will sorry after inr you have reached to this location so uh, in the same way at location number uh, c0001 you have to enter 50 as i told you for the previous one so that way the complete program is entered into the memory right so in the jubin simulator uh, package that i have given to you these steps of entering the code and executing the code are mentioned. So on page number 24, if you will see how to load the program. I mean, if you have written the program in the actual simulator, Jubin simulator, then you can see the program which is written there. Or if you manually want to enter the program in the kit, then this is the procedure to change the content of one particular memory location, right? And this is the procedure for uh, you know, resetting and executing the program. So if you want to execute it, you have to press reset, then go button, and then the starting address from where you want to execute it, and then exec command, right? So in the laboratories, you won't be writing your code onto this particular simulator for most of the times. This will be for just checking your program. Once you check your program here, you will open the actual hardware kit, which I am opening like this here but you will be given an actual hardware computer there. And onto that computer, you have to enter the program from this keyboard. And by following these steps, the steps that I have shown you here, you have to execute that program, right? So it is very difficult exercise because if you have entered only one byte of data incorrectly, then your program will not be executed and you won't be able to figure out where you have made error because it is difficult to see uh, a, a smooth interface like this, where you execute this program and side by side, you can just see what is happening inside these registers. So simulators are helpful in one way for the purposes of understanding. But once we are completely comfortable with that, we have to actually write the program on the hardware kit. So today's task in your laboratory is to make the two programs that I have given to you, calculate the timing, tell it to me. And after that, you have to simply uh, copy these programs into your uh, this trainer kit that I have shown you in this trainer kit and you have to learn the method of how to enter the program and execute it, right? So will you all be able to do it by looking at this particular PDF that I have given to you for entering and executing the programs? Yes or no? Yes, sir. Okay, so please try this and uh, try to execute it. It is 347. Try, uh, try to make the programs that I have given to you and calculate the T states within next five minutes because you have already spent a lot of time there. And uh, then uh, you may write any one of the program into these memory locations and try to execute it, right? So it is 348. I will talk to you at 355. By then, you should have answers to uh, the question that I have posed in the beginning of this lecture. And uh, uh, based on that, I will be taking names of people who have completed this program, right? So hurry up, complete this program and show the results to me. So I will talk to you at 355. Huh? Huh, yeah, tell me. Uh, in the format, there is one procedure slash instruction. In the format? Which yeah, format? Yeah. That you gave that word 
files. Uh, this file? No, 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 no. The lab one. Uh, the instruction, 74 instructions that I have given to you. No. Uh, uh, lab, uh, which you started the class with. Okay, okay. Uh, that, uh, okay. Let me, let me just go to those. Yeah. So I'm opening this lab one. Which one are you talking about? Please tell me. Hmm. Don't know. Down. Which number? Yeah, okay. Eight. Yeah. eight. Procedure okay. or instruction. So here you can simply yeah. write one line that we are executing the experiments on uh, two softwares. Number one is GNU8085. Number second is Jubin Simulator. That's it. Okay. Is there any other procedure that you have followed? Mm. Sorry? Is there any other procedure that you have followed while writing these programs? No. Yeah. So you simply write your programs on the simulator directly. No? So just mention one line that we are using the following softwares on which our programs will be entered and executed. That's it. Right. So uh, you know every uh, every line that you see here, every heading that you see here needs only a one or two line explanation. Nothing else. The main section is your observation, calculation, results, and interpretation section, which can be combined. You can just put screenshots together with proper commented uh, explanations and some extra explanation, which may be handwritten image or maybe typed image as it is required. Right? Yes, sir. OK, so I'll talk to you in five, seven minutes. Till then, you should complete your programs and whosoever completes the program, let me know your names so that I can put them someday.
Okay, so if you have completed uh, the programs that I have given to you together with the required calculations, you may send those programs to me over WhatsApp. I have already received uh, those programs from few members, but I will not name them because otherwise you will just copy their codes and give it to me over WhatsApp. So there is this one person who has calculated uh, this I mean, this total number of time that is required for both of the programs, then I think that it is correct. The program that he has given to me, that program is correct enough. So anyone else who has completed the program fully or maybe partially to the extent of completion, please raise your hands. Two people only, Shivanshu Singh and Anmol Pansari. Hmm. What are the rest of the people doing? Sir, hmm. sir time we have to calculate manually or uh, manually, from program? Manually, you have to calculate it, calculate it manually. You have to make the programs, identify the total number of T-states in every step. <laughs> And whatever is the okay. number of T states, multiply that by 1 over 3 megahertz. Okay, sir, okay, sir. Okay, sir. So ultimately, you only have to calculate total number of T states. That's it. And I wanted you to know that if the calculations happen with, within the registers, CPU registers, they will be fast. However, the equal amount of data transfer will be there. But if you take the external memory into consideration, because of the read and write cycles, more number of T states will be consumed. Okay, so another student has uh, sent me this result but your results are different as compared to the first student okay so there might be some variation in the way you have implemented the program so that is why these differences might be there next student has also sent me the results but you haven't done any calculation You have sent me the assembled version of the file <coughs> and the T states are already given there. So you have just, you just have to sum them up and calculate the results. Okay, another student is sending me some results. Right, so he has written it on the simulator itself on the it editor itself that it will take this much number of seconds, 0 0.00018 seconds. So that is correct. Okay, so I've got screenshots from a lot of people, and that is fair enough. So people who are not participating in the laboratory, there will be repercussions later, right? So uh, you, most of the people are not attending the sessions. I can only see still 63 people here and you will see the repercussions soon when you will not be able to give your minor examinations because I am very strict that way. So if there are 110 people in the class, I could understand that 100 people are attending the class, but if most of them are missing, there will be serious repercussions. I'm very strict that way. You ask any uh, anyone from EC department. So <coughs> attending classes, attending laboratories is mandatory. Okay, I've got some more uh, inputs. Yeah, so someone is asking, is it 20 milliseconds? So it all depends on your program, na? whatever way you have implemented your program. And you have used various calls in your program. So call is an instruction which will be having, uh, since this is an unconditional call that you have used. So 
it will be consuming 18 t states forever so accordingly whatever program you have made accordingly you can sum up the t states and come up with that calculation so there is no one answer to this particular question although if i tell you to make this program efficiently yes there will be a one answer somebody calculated 0 0.02 seconds which also seems perfect Mm, right, yeah, this is also a very nice short and sweet program. Okay, one more uh, is there. Right, so I guess you all will be able to calculate the time that a program requires to complete. Will you be or will you not be able to do that? How many of you will be able to calculate the time that a program takes to complete? Please raise your hands. Only one person? The simple question I'm asking is, you have to calculate the total number of T states that a program takes. So I think it is a very simple thing that uh, you all will be able to do. Now, coming to the next point, let us implement some hardware interrupts. Uh, on the last turn, we have implemented some software interrupts. In today's class, let us try to implement a hardware interrupt, right? So for that purpose, I have already made one program. So let me first show you that program. Okay, I'll keep this new folder outside. And this is the simulator. Yeah, so this is the program for implementing a hardware interrupt. Can somebody tell me by reading this program, which hardware interrupt am I trying to implement? Read this program, tell me what this program will do, and then tell me also that what hardware interrupt will be implemented. So debugging a program screen and is not visible to me. Okay. Screen is not screen is not visible. Okay, I have I think stopped the screen. So yeah. So is it visible now? Yes, sir. So see this program, and you know one one part of coding is to be able to make our own programs. That is correct. But when you will go into an organization where you will be working on a live project with multiple number of peoples, you have to understand what somebody else has written in terms of code. So that is also an art. Debugging is also an art and writing your own code is also an art. So this is a code which is errorless, which I have written. Now tell me what this program is doing and which interrupt is it trying to invoke? Read it takes a few minutes. It is 4, 9 by my watch. And I will talk to you at 4.15. Right? Understand this program and tell me what it does. Till then, I will take a short break.
So, give us a raise your hands if you are already present here. So less than 30 people out of the 62 people who were attending the lab are present at this time. So no issues for you people, but for those who are not present now, I will do something. But uh, how many of you have understood this code? Can someone explain this code, what it is doing, which interrupt it is appealing to, and what is the main body of the code? Can someone explain it? What is happening in the main program? No one wants to explain. Okay, then I have to go by my way of asking questions then. <clears throat> okay, Divyansh Gupta. Not present. Harsh Yadav. Not present. Manish Kumar. Not present. Mayang Jain. Dinesh, please switch off your mic. Parul Agrawal. Not present, very nice. Mm -hmm. And then Prajwal Chaube. Sir? Yes, Prajwal. Can you explain this program? Whatever portion you have understood? No, sir. I can't understand the whole program. It's a very simple program. What is so special in this? At least the main part of this program is very simple. What is being done here? Can you just explain a few lines? Uh, the label thing, it looks like an infinite loop. It is an infinite loop. Yes, that is true. Because there is no condition uh, on this jump statement. This is an unconditional jump. So what it will do is it will keep on incrementing the values of these registers. So that is correctly identified. Anything else about these further lines of the codes? No, sir. Okay. Anyone else? Sir, we are enabling the interrupt and uh, like uh, moving the immediate value to the accumulator. Mm -hmm. After that, we are uh, running an infinite loop. Mm -hmm. Just uh, that is a function. We are not calling it here. And uh, which is the function which you are not? Ah, okay. JZ, JC, JNC, you are not calling. So you mean to say that conditional jump statements are not there. Unconditional jump no. is there. Hmm. Yeah. Then, and then after that, we are like in the bottom part, uh, we are moving the immediate values to the registers A, B, C, D. Uh, that is true, and but uh, why is this bottom part there when the program has ended at halt statement and there is no call instruction here? So what does this thing signify then? So it might be that uh, there is uh, continuously going on. It's an infinite loop. So when it comes to 3000 H, it would execute the ORG 3000H and all the move immediately uh, of uh, take, take it bit by bit. You are saying that it's an infinite loop, which is true. 
now you are saying that when it will come to 3000 h so what is that it which will come to 3000 h so from on 3000 it will go jump from uh, uh, when it is 0034 h then it so will I jump don't understand what you are saying it's an infinite loop all it is doing is incrementing the values of these registers so uh it won't ever come out of this infinite loop so rest of the section as per my opinion is waste am i correct or not yes so we should not need that you should not need that yeah that is true if you only see from the software perspective if you are not touching your computer system it will just keep on executing this this is similar to a situation uh, you all use vlc media players yes sir yes sir. yes sir so there is an option in vlc media player to play the song on repeat i mean the same song will be repeated once it is completed it will again start and it will again play again and and it will continue forever is it or is it not yes sir yeah so yes, sir. if you have your computer you play a song on vlc media player on repeat mode and you do not touch your computer so until there is power in computer it will keep on playing yes or no yes sir yes sir, sir. Yeah. yes sir but now you come to your computer and you press the cross button on vlc media player so it will stop or you will change the setting of vlc media player while it is playing the song for not to repeat the song this you can do in run time right there is a button which you can toggle so that repeat mode will be off am i correct or not yes sir so this is a similar yes, kind of program right it, this is a similar kind of program all of you have identified it correctly that inside the main program it is performing a infinite loop and as long as we do not do something of to the computer externally it won't jump out of that situation it won't come out of that situation right because if you see the software part there is nothing under any circumstances which can stop this infinite loop but we have read interrupts right we have read interrupts and inside interrupts we came to know that interrupts can be hardware triggered also can someone name those interrupts what are the hardware triggered interrupts in 8085 you can have a look at the diagram architecture diagram that i have given to you or the pin diagram that i have given to you and identify what all hardware interrupts are there please see those diagrams rt 1.5 rs 1.5 Should I open that slide? Sir, RST seven point five, six point five, five point five, and like hmm, T. Very there. nice, very nice, right? So if you see this diagram in the interrupt control section, if I zoom it, you can see that these are the hardware interrupts which are available. INTR can be externally triggered RST 5.5 RST 7.5 6.5 trap and INTA is the acknowledge for that so it's not a trigger signal it's an acknowledgement signal so these interrupts can be triggered and if the interrupt is so triggered that it is accepted by the microprocessor what will microprocessor do whatever it is doing currently it will execute the current statement and it will jump to a interrupt service routine am i wrong or am i right am right. i right or am i wrong right yes sir so now look at the code from different perspective and tell me will it ever come out of this infinite loop if some external hardware interrupt is triggered and uh, is this the code corresponding to that external uh, trigger which external uh, trigger am i using
how will you identify which external trigger is being used? So obviously, there are some vectored interrupts. What do you mean by vectored interrupts? Can somebody elaborate? Which contains pretty uh, which contains yes, and address of subroutine. Yeah, there is a defined address of subroutine. So now look at this code from different perspective and tell me which external interrupt is invoked here. Apart from the code which starts at 2000 H location. There are two more locations where I have kept some uh, data bytes, right? They are 0034H and 003, uh, I mean 3000H. So are these two locations, one of the locations of interrupts? For that, you will need to see this chart. Do you find 0034H here or 3000H here? Yes, uh, RST 6.5. You can see this line RST 6.5 and the address happens to be 0034H. So is it now clear to you that this infinite loop is running? But if I will externally initiate and interrupt RST 6.5, in that case, whether it is an infinite loop or not, after suppose the program is at this location, INRC, it will execute this and come out of this loop and serve this interrupt service routine. Is it or is it not? Yes. 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 So at ORG 0034H, we are now sure that it is a RST 6.5 interrupt. So here I have written jump 3000H. Although I could have written my code here directly, but I have written jump 3000H. Why? I could have directly written my code there. Because of, because of page zero issue. Because of? Page zero issue. Page zero issue. What is that issue? Please elaborate. Sir, uh, in page zero, there are some predefined address, so there might be some conflict. Predefined addresses are there, so what is that conflict? That's what I wanted to know. I know that you know the answer, but you need to put it in right technical words. We know that there are, on page number zero, there are vector addresses of various interrupts. Those are separated by how many bytes? Eight bytes. And if the code happens to be more than eight bytes for a particular interrupt service routine, which it is in this case, so we cannot put it at this location 0034 directly because it will overlap. It will overlap. It will start to overlap with this 002CH, which is exactly eight bytes after this. But this code is longer than eight bytes. So we have formed a jump statement and we have moved it out of page zero, that is at address 3000, which happens to be page number 30. And there you have written your code. There it is perfectly okay to write your code. Is it now clear to you what this code is doing, which interrupt uh, when it will be externally initiated, uh, this will jump out of the loop? Yes, sir. Right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Let me assemble it and let us see how externally we can initiate the interrupts in this software. So I'm assembling it. So here I am assembling it and uh, you can do one thing while making simulation. So in this settings option, in this settings option, if you select the simulation speed for step by step process. So this is the simulation speed option for step by step process. By default, it is zero. I mean, it will take the speed of microprocessor, which is one over the frequency in that time duration, one uh, machine instruction will be executed. But you can, for the purposes of good visual understanding, set it to something else. I am setting it to one second, right? So one step will be executed in one second. So this is just for the purposes of our understanding. Now, let me just run this code, right? And let us see what happens. Uh, I will just 
uh, simulate it and I will run it at one time. So now you will see that in one second, every step is getting executed. And since it is an infinite loop, it will continue to do so forever. Can you all now notice this? Yes, sir. Yes. The contents of the registers can also be seen. They are getting incremented by one with every cycle. A was initialized with five and rest everything was initialized with zero. So due to that, A is ahead and rest everything will have the same values after one time the loop is executed. Is it okay? Yes, sir. Yeah, so that's very nice. Now I need to initiate a hardware interrupt and that should be RST 6.5 because for that only I have written the interrupt service routine which starts at location 0034 and there we have written a jump statement. So it will jump to 3000, it will execute this code. So how do I initiate this? So here you can see this blue uh, row here, which is corresponding to various things. So there are some interrupts in that RST 5.5, 6.5, 7.5, trap, INTR. Then for serial input and output communication, you have two flags. I mean, you have two bits there, right? So if I want to initiate RST 6.5, I will simply click on this. Once I will click on this, this zero will become one. And when it becomes one, at whatever stage my code is, that line will be executed and my code will jump to this particular location. I mean 0034. And it will execute whatever is written at the bottom and it will return. Because of this return statement, it will return to the same location where it was where it left the original infinite loop. Is it clear to everyone what is going to happen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So let me change it. So Abhi, the code is, uh, let me let me change it when the code comes at INRB. Yeah, so I have changed it to, oh, sorry. I have changed it to one. So you can see that it has jumped out of the loop. And now it is executing the program at the bottom as per the plan. But now after return statement, it has not jumped back to the main loop. Ideally it should have, but it has not. So I will notify you one more error that the developers of this program have made, which shouldn't have been there. So uh, tell me when an interrupt service routine is executed, the return address is saved on to the stack pointer. Stack pointer, nahi, stack. Stack pointer is a register which is inside microprocessor. The stack is something which is external to the microprocessor. So the return address will be kept on to the stack, which is an external memory. Is it is it known to everyone? Yes. Right. So the yes. programmers who made this software they did a mistake that for hardware interrupts, externally initiated interrupts or hardware interrupts, they forgot to implement the part where they have to put the return address of the program onto the stack. So whenever this program will return, whenever this program will return, uh, ideally it will look the stack and there all 0, 0 values will be present. So it will return to a location 0, 0, 0, 0, right? And since at page number 0, there are all of the interrupts which are present. So it will uh, execute all the interrupts in sequence. So that is a wrong thing. It shouldn't have been there. Ideally, after your code is, ex uh, is executed in this infinite loop, when an interrupt is called, it should jump to the interrupt location and should service that. And return statement should be such that it will be returning to the a program, main program, where you have left the original program, right? But in this system, it has not been implemented in that way because only for the externally initiated interrupts or the hardware interrupts, they forgot to implement that they have to put the address or the return address onto the stack. So this is also one of the precautions that you can mention in your file, that while working with the second version of Jubin simulator, this error is there, so accordingly we have to modify our program. So is this thing understood? What is the right concept and what is the wrong concept as per the Jibin simulator? Are both of the things understood to everyone? 
Yes, sir. Okay. So this is how hardware interrupts are dealt with. So similarly, you can program it for RST 7.5, RST 6.5, and so on and so forth. And um, if you see in the editor, this EI command is essential because inside the 8085, there is one bit for enabling the interrupt. So if you will put that as on, only in that case, these interrupts will be served. Otherwise, these interrupts will not be served. So EI is used for enabling the interrupts. Right. So is this hardware interrupt program understood to everyone? Yes. Yes. OK, so software interrupts we have done on the last turn and there is no error in that. Whenever a program runs to the interrupt service routine, it jumps to the interrupt service routine. It returns to the original program because there they will be saving the address onto the stack. And that is what we have seen on the previous turn, right? However, for hardware interrupts, the makers of this program, uh, they did not take this into consideration, maybe unintentionally. So uh, on their website, if one of you wants, you can report this bug and whenever they will release the next software, they will incorporate this uh, bug. They will just remove this bug into their software and release it anyway, right? So for now in your lab files, you can mention this error also that while calling hardware interrupts, this error will be there. Right. So now uh, for today, write down the third program that you have to implement because we still have, I think, 25 minutes to go. So uh, let us write one more program. So that program is uh, OK. Let me write it on screen so that all of you can keep a record of that. OK, so first thing is this that we have done today. And the second thing that we have done today is we have learned the Kit implementation of the program, right? So we have seen the kit of 8085. So all of you are supposed to run this kit at your homes because if even if you will come to the laboratories, the same kit will be available. So there is no difference in conducting the experiments at your home or in the laboratory. So from my lab, uh, for, from my lab, uh, you shouldn't be affected by this pandemic because. There is no difference in conducting the experiment on this kit inside the lab or the software version of this kit. And I believe that the software version is better because uh, it shows you the view of a lot of things which would not be available in kit that easily. Right? The third thing that you need to do is uh, write a program. WAP means write a program in 8085 assembly language to store following series in external memory and the series happens to be let me take it to be three no no not three let us start the series with uh, two then the second number of the series should be three. The third number of the series should be five and nine and so on and so forth. You need to create this series by using RAL slash RAC slash RRC or RLC. Right. So by making use of these rotation commands and some other logic, you need to create series of this kind: two, three, five, then nine, and so on and so forth. And you need to store this inside the external memory. So the entire remaining time is for this purpose only. Create this series, store it in external memory, and tell me what the results are. Can you all do this? Sir, after 9, you will be 17. Yeah, so you already got the logic. Who said 15? Uh, I said 
Prajwal. Yeah, right. So you already got the logic. So, so please make seventeen also. No, Kimkutu minus one. Nice seventeen. Uh, no, Kimkutu minus one. Whatever is your logic, please implement it. After implementation, we will discuss it. Right. So yeah, it is true that. Uh, i might have given you first few numbers of the series and those first few numbers might be same in two different series as right so there are series where first few numbers are same but after uh, you progress sufficiently then these series they differ so that is also a possibility so whatever is your logic please try to implement it so it is still 9 or you have added 15 What? You added fifteen to it. Ah, I added fifteen to it. I mean, the original question was this. Now, whatever is your logic, you can just go ahead with that. So it is four forty. I'll talk to you next at four forty-five. Till then, you please try to implement this. Sir, can you open the question card?
Okay, so anyone who has completed the program?
Yeah, so I have got a codes from a few students. And I think they have run it perfectly. There are seven or eight students who have done it. Okay, so I have again put that uh, lab 4 file in your files folder. You can all check it in your Microsoft Teams file section. And uh, uh, please also practice these codes, small codes on the microprocessor trainer kit, how to enter codes into trainer kit, how to execute uh, those codes. That all should be known to you, right? So it's a simple procedure. If you know how to write programs and what they are doing, now, this just remains uh, a, a clerical procedure to be covered. I mean, how to enter the programs in kit and how to get them executed, how to see the contents of memory location, how to see the contents of register. So for that, I have already given you the PDF with Jubin simulator. You can see it there and please learn it because when you will go to the industry, they will ask you to run a program onto microprocessor. So programs you will be able to make because we have practiced it thoroughly. This small portion of entering the program into kit remains, which you can do on your own. And if there is some problem, you can always ask me, but that's just a small clerical work that you can do. So try it at your home. And if you have any doubts in this session, you may ask or otherwise I'm closing the session. So whosoever happens to complete the course always send me on WhatsApp because when I will be finally evaluating you all, I always look at my WhatsApp messages and the codes that you have sent there, right? And with time. So if you send the lab codes today itself, I mean in the time duration of lab, they will only be marked. The rest of the codes will not be marked. And be sure about this fact that for the people who are not attending labs and lectures, if they fall short of attendance, they won't be able to appear in the minor examination. This is for sure. So any doubts, anyone? Okay, so I'm closing this session. Thank you, sir.